This is Thomas Wayne Riley, and you have found yourself in the American Southwest. This is part two of the four-part series over the exciting life and mysterious disappearance of Everett Ruiz, who disappeared in the American Southwest in 1934. This episode will cover more of his adventures, and I will quote more from his letters and poetry and his writings. During these adventures, Everett will head both to the Southwest and California, where he will attempt to live out his artist's dream. There will be death, defeat, exploration, and excitement. But first, we must begin back in L.A., where we last left our vagabond for beauty. Obviously, if you have not listened to the first episode, you should do so now, before the music starts. In L.A., as expected, Everett felt a crushing sense of defeat and failure. He was in a horrible mood, and the city depressed him. The wilderness seemed lost, and so was he. But as the author David Roberts puts it in his book Finding Everett Ruiz, quote, Yet he had behind him an exploratory adventure the likes of which few Americans so young had ever accomplished. In ten months, he had traveled perhaps a thousand miles on foot, most of it solo, and seen more obscure and beautiful corners of the wilderness than other devotees of the Canyon Country do in a lifetime. End quote. And that is why he is such an inspiration. That is why he has a cult following. And that is why I am a member of the cult of Everett Ruiz. That quote from Roberts about the incredible exploratory adventure he had undertaken solo is so very true. So few people ever did it in the history of the American Southwest, or really even the nation, no matter what nation or kingdom ruled the territory. Other than American Indians, of course. And I guess early fur trappers, like the Black Jim Beckworth from a previous episode. Everett was among a very select few who traveled so far and extensively alone. D and E had 10 in their group, 13 when they returned. Lewis and Clark had 33, plus Sacagawea. John C. Fremont, who I will do a, an episode or a series on later, he never set out with fewer than 15 men. Everett was alone, solo, except his burrows or his horses. It's amazing. And he did it just to do it, just to feel and experience and enjoy nature, just to get inspired. Here's Roberts again to further elaborate. The template for solo discovery among those fearless wanderers was set by John Coulter between 1806 and 1808. An ace hunter on the Lewis and Clark expedition, Coulter was so little phased by the hardships of that monumental voyage that on the way home, in what is now North Dakota, he asked to be discharged early so that he could return around and guide a pair of trappers who had showed up in the government camp back into the regions mapped by Lewis and Clark. During the winter of 1807-1808, traveling alone, Coulter became the first Anglo-American to discover the thermal wonders of Yellowstone. His reports of geysers, hot springs, and lava pools were almost universally discounted as nonsense, and for a while, the unknown region was nicknamed Coulter's Hill. Even before Coulter, a visionary Dartmouth College student named John Ledyard dropped out of school in 1773 at the age of 21, and rode a canoe he had fashioned out of a fallen log down the Connecticut River to his grandfather's farm. His appetite whetted by this minor voyage. Three years later, Ledger joined Captain James Cook's third expedition into the Pacific Ocean. During his four years before the mast, Ledger participated in the European discovery of Hawaii. 
where his commander was killed by natives. In Paris in 1786, encouraged by the American ambassador, Thomas Jefferson, Ledyard concocted a wild plan to travel from London across Europe, traversing Russia, crossing the Bering Strait, traipsing south through Alaska and Canada, and resurfacing in Jefferson's Virginia. Ledyard made it as far as Siberia before he was arrested and deported by Catherine the Great. Two years later, Ledyard proposed a traverse of Africa from the Red Sea to the Atlantic Ocean. He got only as far as Cairo, however, before he came down with a mysterious illness, of which he died at the untimely age of 37. The unmarked grave in which he was buried on the banks of the Nile is lost to posterity. End quote. As you can see, Everett is clearly among a small and proud tradition of solo wanderers. He is truly a founding father of American wandering. But after him, there will be plenty more. Yours truly included. The next three months of Everett's life at home in Los Angeles are a bit of a mystery. We can only guess he constantly dreamed of returning to the Southwest, though, because by March of 1932, he was back in Roosevelt, Arizona. And he was ready for adventure number three. But adventure number two in the American Southwest. This time, Everett is joined by Clark, who is Clark? We don't know. But he's probably a high school friend. The adventure, though, immediately started out a little rough. First of all, the Apache he had entrusted his burrows with had apparently lost Percival, and Cynthia was now pregnant. So he took back Cynthia, even though she was pregnant, although he sold her to a couple in Roosevelt who wanted the burrow for their young son. So now he was animalless. Well, except Curly. About the Apache man, though, Everett was not pleased, and he wrote to his brother Waldo that, quote, I have learned that all Indians are children, unable to attain to anything like the white man's intelligence, and what this Apache could not understand he counted as nothing, end quote. Yeah, it's a little harsh, but I promise his views on American Indians does change. I mean, it would be frustrating if the Burrow incident happened, you know, to me. To be fair, he also didn't have high praises for his partner Clark, either. He wrote of him, quote, Clark is a childlike slave to tobacco. His grammar is faulty. He has little understanding of art, and he himself has admitted that he is very selfish. End quote. The two, Everett and Clark, were almost immediately out of cash upon their arrival. Even with the selling of the borough and the fact that Everett turned 18 on the 28th of March, which means he got a few presents and some cash. Two days after his birthday, on the 30th, he'd write his family a beautiful description. The writing kind of reminds me of like Hemingway or Jim Harrison or maybe even Craig Childs, one of the authors I often quote. The hills are covered with flowers, lupines, poppies, paintbrush, daisies. A crow is clacking his beak in the cottonwood overhead. Quail are calling. A cardinal has been here. End quote. This tranquility, it would soon get on his nerves, though. And he would write to his parents that it was all too peaceful. It was too still. Plus, Everett and Clark, they were bored. They were broke. He would essentially write, If you're going to send any money, now's the time. The taboo of not asking for money, that had been broken on that last journey. Everett also asked for, and received, quite a few books. Heavy, thick ones, too. By the likes of Dostoevsky and Voltaire and Virginia Woolf. He would read them all, too. Except Brothers Karamazov. He'd save that one. By early May, not only the boredom, but also Clark would be getting on Everett's last nerves. And they were wasting way too much money on hotels and food and tobacco. Maybe Clark wasn't up for the adventure after all. Eventually, that would turn out to be the case, and before long, the two would agree to part ways. To Waldo, Everett would write about this debacle, quote, I bought grub, candy, and cigarettes for Clark and myself for five weeks. Then I told him I did not intend to wait any longer. I invited Clark to leave with me, but he refused to consider it unless he could have a horse and a saddle. As I did not have one myself, I certainly couldn't offer him one. 
End quote. He'd also inform Waldo, his brother, that at about this time, this same time as the falling out, Bill Jacobs, his really good friend he always writes to, Bill Jacobs would arrive. Everett would write, Earlier in the day, Bill had come and persuaded Clark to join him. Bill invited me to go with him, but I had no faith in him and wanted to carry out my plans. I didn't really believe I'd like them as traveling companions anyway. I had grown tired of Clark already. End quote. So after all the backing out that Bill had done to Everett, in the end, probably on account of Clark and maybe Clark and Bill being really chummy, I mean, definitely on account of Clark, but in the end, Everett would part ways with Bill. The two would still be pen pals until the end, though. On May 22nd, Everett wrote in his diary of this incident, quote, two words that are illegible, put distance between me and Clark, As companions, they don't fit the bill. Neither has anything to teach me, though they seem to think so. If they had, why wouldn't I respect them instead of pitying them? End quote. That's a good question. He may have been onto something by abandoning these two, in my opinion. Before he sets out from Roosevelt, Everett bought a horse that he named Pacer, who he decided he was going to ride instead of pack animals this time. He had tried that, And now he was going to try to ride a horse. Although he later write that the horse ended up being more of an outlaw, full of tricks. The two then headed north into the mountains after crossing the Salt River and exiting the Phoenix Basin. On the other side of the river, he made camp, but as usual, disaster struck when he realized Pacer had escaped secretly. This is what Everett's journal says of the incident. Dashed frantically in all directions for half an hour, then found his trail back up the road. Half a mile along was the rope, broken again. Soon sighted Pacer and he galloped off ahead, prayed to God and cussed him. Dark, but half moon. Shouted to car, but he went around it. Another car stopped and the driver had Pacer by the neck, but I didn't have the rope ready and Pacer got off over the hill. Driver must have thought me stupid. Ran and ran. Pacer kept slowing and looking back. Finally got a loop over his head, both drenched with sweat. Tied both ends of the raw hat on his neck and rode him back. Curly had eaten all my supper. I called him and beat him severely. Fried spuds and rope. Thought of fluent, blistering swearing. End quote. Man, poor Everett. And poor Pacer. Uh, Most of all, poor Curly. Beat him severely. Oh, that little dude did not know you were coming back. He just thought it was a free meal. It's free food. I mean, he is a scrappy little res dog, after all. In his journal, Everett had written a few days prior that Curly had eaten some farmer's chickens back in Roosevelt. So Everett had to pay for them. It's no excuse, but no doubt frustration, exhaustion... Maybe some regret and disappointment after leaving his friends. All of that may have come out in this poor little beating of Curly. And then the next morning, Curly was gone from camp. He would never be seen again. Everett would write, quote, I wish he were shot. His distemper is still bad. He doesn't know enough to get out of the road. He kills chicken and steals food. I can't afford to feed him. End quote. Now, this is the least, my least favorite part of the entire Everett story. Having recently lost my sweet big old dog, it makes me sad. Clearly, this adventure was not starting off very well. In Robert's telling of Everett's story, it's here during this adventure that he makes a point to explain the difference between his letters and his journal. Bud, or W.L. Rusho, says the same thing, though, in his Vagabond for Beauty. Roberts explains that while his letters try to keep up a rosy and exciting adventure and appearance, the journal, what hasn't been erased or lost, represents some of the despair and loneliness and misery, and even the little depressions he feels on his journeys. It could be true that the journals were lost on purpose, which we'll discuss later, Or it could also be true, despite the author Bud Rusho saying his parents erased certain lines in his journals, it could be true that Everett himself erases 
quite a few lines and words in his journal. And he probably did so because he regretted writing them. Because it turns out, there are quite a few passages. Lines, words, entire paragraphs were erased from his journal. Sometimes only scattered words were left behind as if it were a puzzle. Despite Everett saying his journals were for his eyes only, it's possible he knew what his ultimate outcome would be. Whether it was accident or not, maybe he wanted to preserve some semblance of how he would later be portrayed. Or it's possible he knew his parents would find and read the journals regardless of him not wanting them to, and he didn't want them to know everything. I mean, this turns out to be pretty wise, since Waldo would indeed share his letters which Everett asks him not to. But sometimes people cannot help themselves, and if they come across your journal, they may read it like it's a book from the library or a magazine on a, on a countertop. I have had a couple people read my journals without asking, even though they didn't open it up, I could see that it was a journal. They just, without hesitation, continued to read them. And that, um, I mean, that was a breach of trust, and it made me change the way I would write. I mean, at least for a time. I mean, I had to start omitting things or doling things and feelings or actions I did in case the journals were read again by people who I didn't want to read them. I mean, eventually I went back to full disclosure, but it is entirely possible that Everett didn't want the people he knew were going to read his journals reading some of the passages that he wrote. Or maybe he did have some dark and mysterious side. But we are all, at least to some degree, guilty of molding ourselves or editing ourselves into how we want others to see us. And Everett is no exception. But Everett's erases seemed to come during tough times when he was looking particularly inward. Roberts has this to say, quote, What is maddening is that the erasers often come just as Everett is probing most deeply into his psyche. For example, on May 19th, four days after Curly ran away, Everett reaches a truly low point. The diary, quote, I'm in a bad position, no dog, an old broken down horse, two lines erased. I may not be able to trade Pacer for a burrow. I will die if he gives out on me, end quote. If it was Everett who erased the passages, his motive may have been simply to guard his privacy, just as, responding to his parents' wish to read his 1931 diary at the end of the summer, he had refused, citing it as, quote, too personal to be read by anyone but the author in its present state, end quote. The evidence that it was Everett who later erased the passages emerges in another lacuna at the end of his despondent May 19th entry. As Rush publishes the text, it reads, quote, killed a scorpion in the gunny sack pack, Gnats and mosquitoes, alone again. The crazy man is in solitude again. Pacer munched foxtails, the full moon round and yellow and the chalky blue sky over distant mesas. No curly to pet. No word missing to hold. Eight lines erased. End quote. In the diary itself, however, the eight-line erasure is more accurately rendered as follows. Quote, one line erased, stupid, two lines erased, eyed, two lines erased, be done. End all quotes. We may never know how the lines got erased, but it seems quite plausible it was the man himself. May of 1932 was a tough month for Everett on his second expedition to the southwest. His third Total. That's going to get a little confusing, I already know it. But on this adventure, Everett wasn't exploring the wilds like he had wanted. He was far too exhausted from constantly working for the ranchers that inhabited the area, trying to make a buck. His horse was giving him trouble, and his dog was gone. In July, he'd write Waldo, and he'd admit how weak he felt and how shameful that was for him to admit. Quote, Physically, I am not very tough. I haven't the constitution of a day laborer. I soon wear out at a job like road building or digging and lifting. This seems to be my physical makeup. Because though I have tried many times, I find I can't do a man's work in physical labor. End quote. I mean, not everyone is cut out for it, brother, I suppose. But I also think he really was at heart. And in his mind, he really was the wandering vagabond artist he portrayed himself to be. He had stamina. He had stamina. 
Maybe just not the strength? I mean, he could walk. But he uses pack animals uh, for the heavy lifting. Maybe for a reason. Not to mention, armchair doctors have diagnosed him with pernicious anemia. He even wrote once in July during this adventure about it affecting him so badly that it caused him to be weak, like too weak. He never wrote about it during that last adventure. Actually, he'd previously bragged about his physique and his stamina and his strength. Remember the book bags and the walking? Maybe his psychological stresses were affecting his physical body. During this time, he also continually writes rather meanly about his old friends, Clark and Bill, and I don't blame him. In one passage after he'd left them, he wrote, quote, I can't trust Clark at all. He was probably doing this to reassure himself that he'd made the right decision to set off alone, but he was indeed lonely. His frail state and his loneliness and his being weak and tired, it even caused him to miss out on seeing some ruins. And then the ruins he did find depressed him, or at the very least disappointed him. He wrote of one ruin, quote, I took one photograph. There was nothing to paint, end quote. In July, he'd also admit to Waldo that he hadn't really been painting or drawing much of anything. Quote, I have not been able to paint for some time, but I am going to try some more before I admit defeat, end quote. It's tough to give up an old beloved hobby. These first four months on the road were clearly rough. If you go through his writings, you'll find that he's lonely, sad, tired, and fatigued. Depressed, probably. He wrote also, quote, I often wish people meant something to one another, and one could find people to one's taste. End quote. I mean, he sure was lonely. On May 23rd, he traded the horse for two burrows. With the animals, he had decided he was going to ride one, use one as a pack animal, and then tie the two together. But this proved incredibly annoying. Roberts writes about it, quote, The horse saddle, modified to fit a burrow, was too big for Wendy and kept sliding off. Peggy stubbornly tugged on her leash, trying to head off in a different direction, thereby stopping Wendy in her tracks. And both burrows balked at every stream crossing, end quote. Uh, obviously, I forgot to mention the two names of the new burrows were Peggy and Wendy. Now, this adventure is just not going well for Everett. Now, he was currently headed towards the Mogollon Rim in May and early June. He was getting out of the Roosevelt area. Uh, to get there, he'd mostly follow roads, including today's 377 in Arizona. And for most of the journey... He would be haunted by loneliness and leeriness at his own journey. He wrote letters even doubting its necessity at this point and its worth. But you truly get the sense that he was lonely. He'd write in his journal, quote, I can't help being different, but I get no joy from it, and all common joys are forbidden me. End quote. He'd also write, I wish I had a companion or someone who was interested in me. Bill and Clark however, would be worse than none. I would like to be influenced, taken in hand by someone. But I don't think there is anyone in the world who knows enough to be able to advise me. I can't find any ideal anywhere. So, I am rather afraid of myself. Obscurantism. End quote. I mean, at that time, in that part of the world, there may not have been anyone who knew enough to advise him. He was breaking ground, really. He was blazing the trail, and trailblazers are often alone in their work. But after all of this, after traversing the wooded Colorado Plateau above the Mogollon Rim and making it to Holbrook, he'd finally have his mental and emotional turnaround. While in Holbrook, a lovely little place I just stayed at in August of 2023, uh, when I was there I met a group of awesome Young Italians traveling Route 66 from Chicago to Los Angeles. I tried to give them ideas on what to see and what to do, but they had all of them already on their itinerary or they'd already checked them off. So I was only good for telling stories, really. Well, in June, in Holbrook, Everett would meet his own new foreign friends. They weren't from a different country, but 
but they were Mormon. And these Mormons were ranchers who allowed him to work for them in exchange for sleeping in guest bunks and ranch houses and barns. He may have even slept more indoors than outdoors that month. During this time, he'd break horses, castrate cattle, build sheds, mend fences. He'd even put on a rodeo. He was basically a cowboy at this point. It wasn't what he ultimately wanted to do, but at least he wasn't lonely. And he was making a buck. He wrote about friends and townsfolk and the ranchers he worked for. He wrote about their fights and friendships. He even attended a local parade and a local church service, although not a Mormon one. And at that church service, he would read from the Bible. Later, he'd write of the experience, quote, Mr. Crosby must have thought I behaved quite well for an unbeliever, end quote. He mentioned that there were more people in the town jail the previous night than at the service, and that these people believed the world would end any day now, any day. They celebrated at church when they learned that Bank of America had just failed. They also worried for their fellow members' souls who, on that very Sunday, chose the rodeo over church service. The passage Everett read from the Bible was from the book of Ruth. Whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Also while in Holbrook, Everett would leave the burrows and pick up two horses. One of them was, quote, skinny as a rail and 12 years old. And a rancher in town told Everett about the horse that he, quote, wouldn't give two hoots for the powder to blow my horse to hell, end quote. As Roberts puts it eloquently, it would be a prescient appraisal, end quote. Everett would continue socializing and working, but despite finally not being lonely, the other side of Everett began to peek out again. The adventurous side. He would write on June 23rd, while still in the town of Holbrook, quote, I will be glad when I am alone again. It is too much work for me to get along with other people. Yesterday, I lay on the bed looking at the ceiling, papered with ragged yellow newspapers, and thought of other ceilings I had looked at dismally. Trees and skies don't give the same futile feeling. End quote. No, they, they sure don't. On the 27th, he'd finally leave Holbrook. He'd cross the Navajo Territory, or Indadineta. He'd sit around fires and eat Navajo fry bread. He'd eat lamb, and he'd talk with the Navajo men. At one point, he learned some phrases, which he recorded in his journal, only to later learn, after repeating them, that the guy who taught him the phrases and which he had been repeating, these phrases, and that guy had just been messing with him and uttering nonsense for his fellow Navajo friends to, like, laugh at. Everett would later write, quote, They talk about me in Navajo, and I will tell you by speaking French, end quote. As he made his way, it would rain, but he would continue his art. Quote, I made a sketch and photographed Butte. The beauty of the wet desert was overpowering, end quote. But again, he lamented that he had no one to share it with. I mean, he just complained that there were too many people to talk to, and now he's wishing that he could share it with somebody. It is the adventurer's dilemma, really. He continued to sleep in the Hogan, scattered around the land like he had last time, despite that being an offense to the Diné people. He probably did not know that. I mean, I assume he didn't know that. As I have learned, ignorance of the Navajo is not an excuse for breaking their rules. On July 2nd, Everett wrote about how he broke open the lock of a Hogan so he could enter it and to sleep. And then a week later, he'd take apart another Hogan and burn half the logs for his fire. I mean, yikes. Hogans are essentially like traditional Navajo homes. Nowadays, they use like modern homes and they keep the Hogans for ceremonial usage nearby or even still scattered out in the desert. Often they'd build one and hope to return to it later if they were in the area. Navajos don't typically tear down the Hogan structures unless someone has died inside one. Even then they don't tear it down completely. The Navajos try to avoid the body and possessions of the dead 
after they have gone to the next world, which is a fact that will be important later in our story, actually. So if someone dies in a Hogan, the Navajos will often break a part of the wall off or open up a hole to let out the spirit and to let other Navajos know that this place is contaminated. Maybe Everett was tearing down Hogans that had been contaminated, but, well, no, obviously, he just broke a lock. So that was clearly still in use. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been locked. Still, it probably wasn't smart or cool, I guess, to burn old Hogans, contaminated by the spirit of the dead or not. And one too many contaminations, which can... A contamination could be a single interaction with the dead, just touching. But one too many brushes with the person's chindi, or spirit, and it can cause ghost sickness, which afflicts a person either physically or mentally. It's always best to avoid those kinds of sicknesses, lest you end up with cancer or some other such disease, or or you end up lost in the wilderness at 20 years old, never to be seen or heard from again. And to add more bad juju, Everett pretty much killed every single rattlesnake he would find along the trail. He would do that in California as well, and throughout all of his adventures in the Southwest, but boy, did he love killing rattlesnakes. He'd then keep the rattlers as souvenirs. And he did all of this in Navajo country, where the Diné, or Navajo people, believe the great snake is a being that is wound into the very fabric of the landscape itself. After showing a dead snake to a Navajo boy who freaked out, Everett wrote in his journal, quote, They said I would die, and looked at the snake. They ran like little girls when I waved it at them, end quote. He's tempting fate a little bit at this point. He'd then go on to write some more rather disparaging comments about Navajos before being invited to stay in a Navajo Hogan near the famous Hubble trading post near today's Ganado, Arizona. He would write of this experience, quote, His oldest daughter, Alice, is the most beautiful Navajo girl I have ever seen. End quote. Highlights from the next few days of his journal are about the young woman. Unlike some members of the cult of Everett Ruiz and others with perverse agendas, I am not going to speculate whether or not Everett was gay or homosexual. His writings overwhelmingly relay the life of a young man who is healthy in his sexuality as a straight young man, like when he wrote in his journal on June 26, 1932, that the pastor of the Doomsday Church, Mr. Brown, and his wife had three daughters with, quote, the eldest rather pretty, end quote. And that's all I'll say about that for now. It will come up again later. So despite the turnaround, Everett was indeed still in some dire straits. He was still always tired. And now, his eyesight was leaving him? He'd write, quote, My eyes are wretched. They have been paining me severely. I couldn't recognize my horse until I was upon them. End quote. Two days later, quote, for hours I lay half dead on the sand under the pignon, feeling too weak to rise. My eyes burned when I read, and nothing seemed to give joy. Mentally, I wrote my last letter. End quote. Regardless of this mystery pain, he would still read and he would still write letters. He read everything from other adventurers, like Arabian Nights, Shakespeare's plays, Mormon theological texts, newspapers, magazines, medieval novels, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He read books on the Navajos. He read a lot. His eyes probably hurt because to read in the summer sunlight of the high desert is begging to be blinded. I mean, those white pages and the endless fire of the sun. He also began to take more photographs and make more sketches again, so at least his art was returning. On July 11th of 1932, Everett made it back to Chinle, uh, which is near Canyon de Chez, the little town, little Navajo town. I mean, despite not wanting to see old sites again, the same old sites, he decided to rekindle his love of the Southwest by going to Canyon de Chez, which that was the place where he found the necklace after climbing the dangerous cliff. The rekindling seems to have burned bright for, in a long letter to Waldo, he would write, quote, the country is fiercely, overpoweringly beautiful. 
He then goes on to describe in beautiful detail a night out on the beautiful Colorado Plateau. The night before last, near the lake, I made camp by moonlight. Inky clouds swept across the sky. Wild winds whiffed by. Lightning flashed and thunder muttered ominously. Some bulls nearby roared like lions. The storm blew, and to my ears sounded like hyenas, or a frightened herd of goats. End quote. In pencil, at the bottom of this long letter, he wrote to his brother Waldo. He'd write one of the most memorable lines of his life. I have been thinking more and more that I shall always be a lone wanderer of the wildernesses. God, how the trail lures me. You cannot comprehend its resistless fascination for me. After all, the lone trail is best. I hope I'll be able to buy good horses and a better saddle. I'll never stop wandering. And when the time comes to die, I'll find the wildest, loneliest, most desolate spot there is. End quote. You don't have any idea right now of how eerie that passage is. But you will find out later. And I will quote it again quite a few times. And when the time comes to die, I'll find the wildest, loneliest, most desolate spot there is. With renewed resolve, Everett was now heading once again through Canyon de Chez. Both canyons, because there are two canyons at Canyon de Chez. First, de Chez, and then del Muerto. He would then head across the Lucachucai Mountains, and then on to Shiprock, before going up towards Mesa Verde. He would write in his journal, quote, God, how the wild calls to me. There can be no other life for me but that of the lone wilderness wanderer. End quote. While his art was reviving, he began to copy Anasazi petroglyphs and pictographs. He would try to find unexplored Anasazi ruins, but many proved to be either too dangerous to reach or he already explored. Although amazingly, he would find arrowheads and a yucca sandal in some of the ruins. This mysterious eyesight affliction would return to him, though, and he would write that he felt drunken. Quote, I reeled and swayed in the saddle and felt decidedly out of my usual nature. For some time I could hardly see. End quote. Had he drank some wares before? I mean, possibly with those cowboys or the old bootlegger? Most certainly. And that was at a time where that was not per permitted by law. At Spider Rock, that blasted beautiful spire that I have yet to see, but at Spider Rock, Everett would turn around and head to the mouth of the Southern Canyon so he could go up to Canyon del Muerto. But his sadness would return during this leg of the journey, or as I call it, or Jack Kerouac called it, the doldrums. At the mouth of the canyon during his doldrums, Everett wrote in his journal, quote, I felt futile. It seemed, after all, that a solitary life is not good. I wish I could experience a great love. I find that I cannot consider working, even in art. To be a real artist, one must work incessantly, and I have not the vitality. More and more I feel that I don't belong in the world. I am losing contact with life. It seems useless to paint when nature is here, and I can't paint anyways. End quote. Three days later, he would write further of this sadness. Quote, I think I have seen too much and known too much. So much that it has put me in a dream from which I cannot waken and be like other people. I love beauty, but have no longer the desire to recreate it. End quote. If he had written all of this before his ultimate disappearance, we would know his ultimate fate, I think, right? But since we don't have that journal, we can never know what truly happens to him at the end. But we know he makes it out of this. Because, well... He, he makes it out of it. But it is troubling and, and sad to see so much sadness from such a talented young adventurer. And then, 
To make things worse, once starting up the steep Canyon del Muerto, or in Spanish, or which is Spanish for Canyon of Death, he would deal with a harrowing death of his own. So by now he'd renamed his horses Jonathan and Nuflo, and the three of them began the canyon's adventures. But, to quote Everett, It was so steep that I led Nuflo, and Jonathan had to be urged. Finally he fell or lay down in a rough spot about halfway up. I thwacked him, but he would not rise, so I unpacked him there. When I pulled out the pack saddle, John slid off the trail, turned over three times on the downslope, and tottered to his feet. I led him up, put Nuflo's saddle on him, packed Nuflo, and slowly descended. End quote. He then headed back to his previous camp where he quote, unloaded and led the horses on the bank where the grass was very sparse. I didn't hobble Jonathan. He went around in circles and didn't eat. I washed a cut on his leg and he stood for a while, then staggered sideways and fell into a clump of cactus where he lay a while. Then he got groggily to his feet, tottered again, and collapsed. Then I prepared myself for the worst and began looking at my map to see how near a railroad was. In a little while, I looked at Jonathan again, and he was dead. Eyes glassy green, teeth showing, flies in his mouth. End quote. He'd write of the incident, quote, So for me, Canyon del Muerto is indeed the canyon of death, the end of the trail for gentle old Jonathan. End quote. After the tragedy, he would take the saddle up to an Anasazi ruin and bury it there, where he said, quote, The ghosts of the cliff dwellers will guard it. End quote. Jonathan the horse was left where he died. I mean, after all, he was way too heavy to move or even to bury. Everett did comment that no doubt a Navajo would steal the horse's shoes, but would they risk the ghost sickness? Also, is that really theft? Later, he'd write an essay about this whole sad experience. As I stalked down from the high-perched ruin, lightning flashed out from the darkening sky. Thunder rolled and reverberated in the narrow canyon. A vivid arrow flare of piercing brilliancy struck down at the red cliffs, ricocheting with a sickening whine like a hurtling shell. With a grinding, grating sound, a mass of rock slid down the cliffside. In a moment, the cloud burst came. The water cascaded from the gleaming rocks and poured frothily from a thousand sources into the plunging stream. I flung the pack on Nuflo's wet back and lashed down the stiff tarpaulin. Afoot, I breasted the foaming torrent, Nuflo following obediently. For hours I trudged upstream, until at dusk I reached the head of the canyon, camping in a dry cave. End quote. I mean, that's a really tough break for the young man. But he does write in his journal that he will not let it dishearten him, although he will be haunted forever by the sight of Jonathan running sideways. He knew he couldn't afford another horse, and besides, it was tough work anyways. So he was going to trudge forward with new flow. At the Navajo settlement of Tseli, Everett would buy food, cookies, peanut butter, and cigarettes. All the essentials. Apparently, he had been smoking the entire time, much like everyone else in the 1930s. But he hadn't really recorded it until... Just now, I guess he said he bought cigarettes with Clark, but he mostly complained about how Clark smoked them all. Quote, I smoked half a dozen cigarettes, watching the beautiful spirals of blue smoke, blowing rings, and looking at the fungus on the rafters. End quote. His mother apparently disapproved, and in a letter to her, he lied and said he only smoked sparingly. Maybe all those smokes were hurting his bones. Because on July 23rd, while traversing the Lukachukai Mountains, he wrote in his journal, quote, There was such a stiffness and soreness in my limbs as I had never known before. My shoulders seemed bruised and my thighs ached piercingly when we climbed. End quote. 
the smokes, or the ghost sickness. Four days later, he wrote, quote, My legs are weaker than ever. I'm filled with a violent desire to go home. End quote. Sometimes it's best not to ignore those violent desires. In Shiprock, he was disappointed he only received one letter from his mother. But while there, he would drop off a long letter to his friend, Bill. He then hitchhiked or walked the road up to Mesa Verde from New Mexico. He'd comment along the way on two sexy women he had seen in a car that slowed down to peep him as they passed. But once in Colorado, out of Navajo land and into Ute territory, after buying some supplies... Another tragedy befell him. He describes the incident in his journal. The trail led along the edge of a bank in a quite narrow pass with the high bank above and below. I supposed it was passable, because it was there. Nuflo went ahead, scraped safely by, but around the turn, the ledge was narrower. There was nothing to do but go on and Nuflo was within a few yards of safety when at a particularly narrow spot, his kyak, which is a pack sack, pushed him out and he began to slip off. He lunged up again, but once more, the pack pushed him off. He clawed the ledge frantically, then fell down into the current of the muddy Mencos. It was deep near the bank, and he floundered about and wet his pack. When the kyaks were full of water, he could not lift them, and he floundered miserably and floated downstream several yards. He could not stand up. End quote. He wrote that all he could do was yell from the bank, quote, Oh, for God's sake! For God's sake! And then he jumped into the water up to his waist and tried to pull the horse back onto the bank. At this point, I mean, it was so heavy, filled with water, the strap around the horse's neck broke, sending his saddle and his pack also into the water. Nuflo and Everett got to shore, thankfully, and there he tied up the horse to a cottonwood before going back into the river to fetch his now soaked gear. Unfortunately, a nice blanket floated away. He writes further, quote, I heaved at the bedroll. It weighed like lead. I had to try a dozen times before I could get it on the bank. End quote. Alas, Everything was soaked, and a lot of his stuff was ruined, like his camera and flashbulb, for starters. His sketches and paintings, his food, his papers and journal, although his journal was able to be saved in the end. To try and dry everything out, he strung it all along a fence, but then it started to rain. He attempted to save his gear by throwing a tarp over it all, though. He then hitchhiked back to the trading post, and once there he helped the owner unload some goods before buying some cigarettes and candy, and then borrowed some clothing and a rug to sleep on. Despite all of that, though, Everett was bound and determined to reach Mesa Verde. He wanted to see where Weatherill made his mark. He wanted to see all those ruins. Now, part of this whole fiasco of falling into the Mancos River was because Everett's, he was determined to reach the mesa and the park and the ruins by a southerly route, a route that the trading post worker doubted existed at all, and a route I know used to be blocked and fortified in Mesa Verde times by walls and turrets and boulders perched precariously at points to crush the invaders. Possibly invaders from Chaco. After the river fiasco, Everett took new flow of the horse. Despite him not wanting to listen, ever. But he took the horse through trails to find this southern route. He'd get a little lost, but some utes would correct him. Then the horse would refuse or would just go off spiritedly on its own whimsical direction. But this didn't bother Everett too much because, quote, I am in no great rush to reach the park. It will mark the termination of my wanderings, my independence. I can't even see the cliff dwellings independently. All tours go in an auto caravan with a ranger. End quote. I wish I had known that before I went, personally. And it's good to know my disgust of this babysitting 
by the rangers is universal in us southwestern wanderers. He'd be appalled at the restrictions at Navajo National Monument and many other places. Eventually, he would give up on this south route and head to the headquarters on the northern end of the park and then head up to the campground. While at the park, in a letter to his family on August 25th, he would ride out some truly palm-sweating and harrowing climbs and cliff-tiptoeing he'd do while dancing with death on the edge of ledges and sandstone overhangs. It all sounds awesome and fun, and he explored ruins that may not have been explored in hundreds of years, except for the weather rails. But there was a very good chance he could have fallen or slipped or been rimrocked or stuck in an alcove to die next to 700-year-old ruins, probably on top of skeletons already laid to rest there. Quote, There was another dwelling near Horse Springs, which could only be reached by worming up a nearly vertical crevice, part of the way hanging by my hands. End quote. Oof. I love climbing. And chimney climbing up a crevice, well, is not the most difficult. It's still scary. And one slip means you're jammed inside a tight hole where you may not be found for decades. Until some Californian hiker sees you, takes some bones, and wonders if it's you. Foreshadowing. Everett would write to his family, quote, In spite of all the reverses, hardships, and difficulties, I find the Wilderness Trail very fascinating. I think it would be cowardly to turn back at this stage of the game. You have no idea how flabby and pale the city is compared with the reality, the meaningful beauty of the wilderness. End quote. At the same time, though, he'd wonder what kind of fun and new things he would do once he made it back to Hollywood. And he'd reassure his parents that he was scanning the horizon for California-bound vehicles. Mesa Verde, it turns out, was just too packed with people with tourists, city folk. It was far from wild. Not to mention, after the death and the soak and the physical ailments, he was plumb worn out. Everett was tired. It was indeed time to head home. But while he was there at Mesa Verde, he did make a really awesome block print of Square Tower House Ruin that I want to hang on my own wall. But all this exploring came at a price. A dangerous one at that. No, he didn't fall. He got poison ivy. Again. And on top of that, he didn't find a ride back to LA, so he just started hitchhiking. His first ride got him to Gallup, New Mexico. His second ride took him to the Grand Canyon through his quote-unquote magnetic personality. Once at the Grand Canyon, despite heading home, he prolonged his stay. Naturally, as one does when they get to the Grand Canyon, he hiked twice to the river and killed his eighth rattlesnake. And this one was, quote, a rare species found only in the Grand Canyon, end quote. Come on, dude. From the Grand Canyon, he got a ride down out of the Colorado Plateau and on to Kingman. And from there, he went across the border on Route 66, which had only been around for six years at that time, but he made it to Needles. Then from Needles, he was dropped in a strange part of L.A. during a dense fog. He was disoriented, but he was home, and he was not thrilled. Roberts sums up this less-than-enthusiastic trip when he writes about it, quote, He had spent five months in the Southwest, not ten, And during some ten weeks of his time, he had effectively been marooned, first in Roosevelt, then in Holbrook. His 1932 journey had covered less than half the distance of his previous year's pilgrimage, and relatively little of his traveling had taken him through true wilderness. Much of the time on the trail, in 1932, Everett was plagued by exhaustion, by aching throughout his body, and by some kind of painful eye affliction. He never sorted out the logistical problems posed by a series of inadequate pack animals, and he had suffered four calamities. The schism with Bill and Clark, the beating and disappearance of his dog Curly, the death of Jonathan, and Nuflo's plunge into the Mancos River. End quote. But still, an adventure is an adventure, and you have to take the bad ones with the good ones to appreciate the truly awesome times. <laughs> 
To sum up the next few months in California, I will quote from Everett himself. I got into college by rather a fluke. End quote. You heard that right. No doubt on account of his parents, Everett had enrolled and had been accepted as a freshman at UCLA. But there's little other than that bit of info that we know. He didn't write too much in his journal or in his letters about the time. We do have some of the things he wrote while in school, though. One is titled, I Go to Make My Destiny. Here is the ending. Bitter pain is in store for me, but I shall bear it. Beauty beyond all power to convey shall be mine. I will search diligently for it. Death may await me. With vitality, impetuosity, and confidence I will combat it. My heart beats high, but my eyelids droop. Tomorrow I will go. Adventure is for the adventurous. Life is a dream. I am young and a fool. Forgive me and read on. End quote. Death may await me. Adventure is for the adventurous. Life is but a dream. During this semester, Everett really enjoyed music. Like, religiously. You see, outside of painting and writing and adventuring, Everett loved music. He would write a friend, quote, Music means more to me than any other art, I think. End quote. During his time at college, it seems he really played those records and attended many a concert. But music was really his only passion while at the university, it seems. I mean, apparently he did well in English and geology, and that makes sense. And that's about it. History, philosophy, and ROTC, he did poorly. And with the ROTC part, I don't blame him. Uh, in high school, in Georgia, I failed ROTC. I got an F. The only F I'd ever received in my entire life. It was truly a miserable experience, though. But apparently, the university was a truly miserable experience for Everett as well. Because after only one semester, he was done. Everett would write to a friend shortly after that one semester and say, quote, How little you know me to think that I could still be in the university. How could a lofty, unconquerable soul like mine remain imprisoned in that academic backwater, wherein all but the most docile wallow in a hopeless sloth? He also writes, Even after climbing out of the maelstrom of college, I find that life is still a whirl, though no longer a swirl. I have, however, been on several back-chick revels and musical orgies. End quote. By back-chick revels, he's referring to the Roman parties of revelers who worshipped the party god of Greece and Rome, Dionysus. He may have had a different name in Rome, I don't remember nowadays. Now, maybe during these revels, there was some law-breaking. Again, this is Prohibition era. But maybe the laws of man meant little to the mighty wanderer. To another friend, he wrote about the wild and wooly outdoors. Quote, I had some terrific experiences in the wilderness since I wrote you last. Overpowering. Overwhelming. But then I am always being overwhelmed. I require it to sustain life. End quote. John Muir, the famous fellow adventurer and photographer, would write of the outdoors, quote, In every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. End quote. I would say that is absolutely true for not only myself, but for our nature walker Everett Rubis as well. He truly received even more than he could withstand as he would later write. After this single semester, it was adventure time. But Everett decided to forego the American Southwest this time. And I imagine it was for two reasons. One unstated and the other he does write about. The first unstated reason he goes where he does is because of how badly the last excursion to the Southwest went. The second reason he elaborates in a September 1932 letter when he writes, quote, After months in the desert, 
I long for the sea caves, the crashing breakers in the tunnels, the still, multicolored lagoons, the jagged cliffs and ancient warrior cypresses. End quote. So instead of the American Southwest, Everett travels for a second time north, towards the Pacific Ocean and towards the mountains of the Sierra Nevadas. And his fourth adventure would hopefully go better than the last. Technically, at Christmas time, he does go up to Carmel, which is on the coast, and he enjoys the ocean and sells some Christmas cards. But he heads back down to Hollywood briefly before heading again towards the Sierra Nevadas. He writes to a friend. In a month or so, when it is hot, I am going to shoulder my pack and go up into the Sierras with some rice and oatmeal, a few books, papers, and paints. It will be good for me to be on that trail again. End quote. It's good for us all, brother. His first stop on this adventure would be a place I am absolutely in love with and completely and totally enthralled by. It took my breath away the first and only time I was there. Although I've tried to head back multiple times, unsuccessfully. Unfortunately, this last winter's massive snowstorm has made travel to the region quite difficult and sometimes impossible, depending on where you're coming from. And my wife and I have always came from the wrong side. But in 2022, my late puppy dog, my wife and I all traveled to Sequoia National Forest. And that's Everett's first stop. I mean, until you see the towering, massive, fresh-smelling trees and their soft bark, and fallen limbs the size of trees, until you see the ridiculously shallow root system and feel the resin that protects them, until you visit these amazing and massive trees and their peaceful surroundings, it is impossible to fully understand just how incredible and big and beautiful the mighty sequoias truly are. This trip to Northern California would be four and a half months, and it would be filled with a lot of journal writing, but very little letter writing. He would, of course, write his parents and ask for books and ink and money, and uh, all the while his brother would move out of the, his parents' house, and his parents were still struggling to make ends meet during this tough time that was the Great Depression. Everett's Depression or sadness, whichever one it was, it doesn't really show up in the journal writing. Although I believe he still suffered a little bit from it, and as you'll see as well. The journal, though, it has a healthier sort of record keeping. He doesn't seem as exhausted or down or tired, and the ailments don't try to destroy him. But one letter to his parents does shed some light on maybe why he was so down on that last trip. That last trip may have been a deal he had made with them, saying, I'll go to college after this trip if you help me out. I mean, maybe. There's no evidence of that, but there is evidence that maybe he was suffering from some sort of sadness every now and then. In a letter during this fourth adventure, he says, quote, to his parents, quote, No, I am in no danger of a nervous breakdown at present. How about you? End quote. For the start of this journey... Everett's brother, Waldo, and Waldo's girlfriend at the time, drove Everett to the southern edge of the Sequoias before dropping him off there. Oh, and Bill Jacobs stood him up again. On his second day, he'd wrangle up some burros from a rancher that he'd later name Betsy and Grandma. He wanted to head up into the high Sierras, but a ranger told him, No way. There is far too much snow up there. A story I know well. During this adventure, he would swim and fish and hike and talk with strangers at length. Sometimes he'd even hike with the strangers. Not so much for the lone trail. But of course, while he enjoyed the company, he did once complain on June 23rd, quote, I've had only two days of uninterrupted solitude, end quote. He'd also write, Thus far, I have been free of watches and clocks. I never wonder what time it is, because for myself, it is always time to live. End quote. In a letter to an unknown person with the date missing, he'd reiterate his lack of need for the knowledge of time. Right now, I am sitting on a hill overlooking the marble fork of the Kawea River. The colors are glorious. Fleecy white clouds, a clear blue sky, 
Distant blue hills flecked with snow. Tall pines all around me. Monstrous gray glacial boulders and patches of sunlit moss on the fir trees. The snow water rushes and pounds through its rocky channel, tumbling frothily into lucent green pools. Here I seem to be in my element, save for the lack of intellectual companionship, which is not utter and is troublesome wherever I am. And for a few trifling disturbances, I have nothing to lament. More than ever before, I have succeeded in stopping the clock. I need no timepiece knowing that now is the time to live. I have lived intensely on several occasions here. End quote. He then goes on to describe a few amazing adventures, which everyone should check out Vagabond for Beauty by Bud Rusho. Everett would in fact communicate with rangers, policemen, post office employees, CCC workers, and a whole bunch of tourists. He tried to sell his art to uh, all these many people, but he wasn't all that successful. On the 20th of June, he wrote about how he had met some attractive ladies who passed him on the other side of the stream, but they didn't show too much interest in him. Then, around the time he describes their ignoring of him in the journal, there's an 18-line erasure, which is one of the longest in all of his journals, longest erases. It turns out when the girls returned, they continued to ignore him, which further irritated him. It happens, ma'am. When not hiking, he was sketching or reading, and he seemed genuinely enjoying his time out in the mountains and forests of California. Which, who doesn't enjoy that? Roberts writes of his time in California. As he hiked in the forest, Everett often sang out loud. Sea shanties and cowboy ballads, he mentions in one entry, but more often he hummed his favorite classical music. I drank at a stream, he wrote on June 12th, and strode gallantly up, singing some Dvorak melodies, putting all the volume I had into them. The forest boomed with my rollicking song. Then the transmuted melodies of Beethoven, Brahms, and the Bolero rang through the silent forest. End all quotes. On June 12th, or thereabouts, he'd send a letter saying, During the last few weeks, I have been having the time of my life. Much of the time I feel so exuberant that I can hardly contain myself. The colors are so glorious, the forests so magnificent, the mountains so splendid, and the streams so utterly, wildly, tumultuously, effervescently joyful that to me at least, the world is a riot of intense, sensual delight. End quote. In early July, once the snow had really begun to melt, he finally made his way northwards towards Mount Whitney, for he had not yet climbed Mount Whitney, the tallest point in the lower 48, and at that time, I guess, the United States period, nor had he ever even seen it. He was still running into people, and he'd stop at ranger stations, old cabins, and he'd go to working ranches, even. He'd meet naturalists, and he'd really get to know some of these strangers and even some rangers. Everett would fish a lot, and he loved it. And he would even write about his love of fishing. After patient casting in a deep pool, I felt a tug on my line, and, thrilled to the core, swung the pole and the biggest fish I ever caught thudded up on the bank. I hunted five minutes before I found him in the deep break, but he was still flopping. I could hardly close my fist on him. He was a foot long and weighed at least a pound. How I shouted. End quote. One of his best days was a catch of 40 fish. I personally just don't have the patience for fishing, really. I mean, I enjoy it. I like the idea of it, and I especially like being out in the wilderness. Once, I went camping and fishing with some friends in northern Wisconsin, as I do every year. And between the three of us, my Wisconsin redneck friend, Muskrat, the French beaver trapper, Matthias, and I, nicknamed Skindiana Jones, for reasons I will not get into, well, between the three of us, over 300 fish were caught that weekend. I, personally, caught three of those 300. On this last trip, though, in 2023, the two taught me to fly fish, and now I am hooked on the hobby, although I haven't gotten to do it too often since June. One of those times was in the Kern River, which is an area Everett would have passed by and a place he talks about. <laughs> 
Back to Everett, though. To keep up with his tradition, he will fight and kill a mean old rattler. The brush was almost impenetrable. Taking my life in my hands, I reached down and caught his tail, loosed the makeshift spear, and whipped him out on the rocks. He was very much alive, but after a few tries, I mashed his flat head and cut it off. Only six rattles, and he is not long. But what a fight we had. It was true sport. Hunting rattlers as I do comes nearer to real sport than almost anything I know. It has the necessary element of danger, for it is not a sport unless opponents are somewhat evenly matched, and the quarry can turn the tables on the pursuer. By comparison, fishing is a diversion for senescent bachelors, end quote. I mean, I love rattlesnakes, but somehow I never see them in all my travels through the Southwest. And that's probably because I usually travel in winter and spring, but still, it is surprising that I never see them. Well, I have seen one, and that was in May of 2021. I was walking with my future wife at the time in Bandelier National Monument. We'd just seen Alcove House, and we'd climbed down the ladders. Well, I ran down them like a show-off, but we were walking in the forest by the creek when a small snake slithered by. And I made the silly comment that, dang, I wish that had been a rattlesnake, because I never see them. My wife said, no, don't wish that. And then... I mean, not two minutes later, while we were talking and walking in the parking lot, I glanced down at the stick on the path that was in front of me, and I realized it was a snake. I pushed my wife out of the way. I mean, I divert my falling foot so as not to step on it, like inches from actually stepping on it. It's a little lethargic rattlesnake. And then I tear off down the path with my heart leaping out of my throat. It liked to kill me just from a heart attack. I hastily pulled out my phone and took a shaky video. I mean, that thing, it was beautiful, and uh, we, we both scared each other, it seems. And then he just meandered on under some bushes, probably cold and tired. On July 14th, at the Kern River Hot Springs, Everett met up with two younger boys who also attended the same high school as he had, Hollywood High. And their names were Charlie and Ned. Quote, Ned has some intelligence, but Charlie is rather callow. End quote. They were also pretty religious. Nevertheless, Everett paired up with the two dudes as they all climbed up to Mount Whitney. Then, six days later, they reached the summit, which again is the highest point in the lower 48. The day after the ascent, Everett blazed the lone trail yet again. But the happiness and joy he'd had so far was, by now, beginning to fade. First off, the scenery was kind of getting to him. He was growing tired of the gray rocks and the impenetrable forest. He would write in his journal that, quote, I chanted Navajo and enjoyed the thought of return to northern Arizona. End quote. Then he found Grandma. The gray burrow was pregnant. He'd bought a pregnant burrow. He'd write, quote, Poor ignorant creature. She had no knowledge of contraceptives. End quote. Then he got a cut on his hand that was so bad it grew infected to the point of him keeping him like keeping him up at night. And that's an easy, very easy way to lose a hand. But because of this infection, which got so bad, he had to retreat out of the mountains and down into the central Joaquin Valley of California, where he would see some doctors who would soak his hand in Lysol and warm water. They'd inject him with Novocaine and cut him up further. They'd diagnose him with blood poisoning which is when the infection spreads to your blood, which can be often fatal. Despite all of this, though, he continued his adventure. But he did admit, quote, I am not a good left-handed camper, but I did my best, end quote. On August 28th, after his hand had healed and his adventure had grown monotonous yet again, Everett wrote, quote, I find sleep very unpleasant. I cannot bear to yield consciousness without a struggle, especially as I sleep so poorly. I call sleep temporary death. End quote. Another interesting snippet into his subconscious. But it could also be explained by possible fevers from the blood poisoning. Because at that same time he wrote to a Doris Myers, not sure who that is, and said, quote, 
I have been feeling so happy and filled to overflowing with the beauty of life that I felt I must write to you. It is all a golden dream, with mysterious high rushing winds leaning down to caress me, and warm and perfect colors flowing before my eyes. Time and the need of time have ceased entirely. A gentle, dreamy haze fills my soul. The rustling of the aspens lulls my senses, and the surpassing beauty and perfection of everything fills me with quiet joy and a deep, pervading love for my world. End quote. Everett is, after all, an 18-year-old young man who spends months in the wilderness and days without seeing another soul sometimes. And he is very perceptive to the world around him, so it's quite natural his mood should shift. Look at me. Now I'm armchair diagnosing him. But at least my diagnosis is that he is a natural human being. Although I'm not discounting some of the theories others have put forth, about his mood changes, I just don't think it's a good idea or habit to armchair diagnose historical figures. At this point, Everett was determined to reach Yosemite by way of the then, very recently, and mostly completed John Muir Trail. It would take him almost a month. And during that month, he was often gloomy in his writings. One evening, September 6th, he wrote, quote, I set less and less value on human life as I learn more about it. I admit the reality of pain in the moment, but its opposite is not strong. End quote. And then two days later, after stirring up a bee's nest in some tangly brush, he was stung a dozen times. This is what he wrote of the nightmarish experience. I struggled frenziedly down to the water, tearing my shirt, I had to leap down onto some wet rocks, then I climbed up some more, pulled out the stings and the bees in my hair, threw off my clothes and plunged into the water. Then I seemed to burn all over, and looking down I discovered that my body was a mess of poison oak blisters. The shock nearly broke me, and I felt sick all over. When I was trying to put on my shirt, I fell into the water and could not find the strength to get out until I was half drowned. End quote. This very well could have easily been the his last moments. It could have proven fatal to many people, especially if he had been allergic. Well, after he nearly drowned, he crawled back to the trail, but it took him hours to do so. And during the crawling, he would throw up everything in him. He wrote, quote, I could see nothing but blackness and fell back, exhausted, dizzy and faint, end quote. During the crawling, Everett, of course, covered his body with the disgusting oils of poison oak, which he then blamed for his further collapse after the shock of the stings. While the poison oak may have aggravated him, it certainly wouldn't have acted that quickly, although he is really allergic. But most likely he was suffering from anaphylactic shock from all of the many, many bee stings. Apparently, two days later, he still had swollen eyelids and lips. Stand by me, anyone? Too soon? So his nemesis, Poison Oak, the bee stings. It sounds like it was an absolutely horrific incident, plus the drowning. He was truly lucky to have survived it all. But before long, he'd be back on the trail. Starting on September 18th, Everett would join a group of six disappointed hunters who would take him on a ridiculous nine-day journey toward Yosemite. Roberts writes pretty well about him this incident, so I'll just quote him. The six hunters hired the 19-year-old to burrow, pack their supplies into the upper reaches of Fish and Silver Creeks in the High Sierra, and to cook and wash dishes for them. The diary account of this junket reads like a chapter out of Don Quixote, as the incompetent hunters miss one shot after another, but finally kill a deer, too young to be legal game. They also shoot a doe, another violation, just to enrich their dinners with venison. Much of the men's camp time is taken up with drinking, cursing one another, and worrying about game wardens. One of the hunters regularly gets lost on his daily prowls in search of four-point bucks. End quote. I mean, it sounds like a fun, but highly illegal time. After the misadventure with the hunters, the six men give Everett 
10 bucks, dollars, sorry, 10 dollars, a pack of smokes, and some venison. He seems to have taken the experience in good stride. He seems to enjoy having those kinds of adventures. Also at this time, he would spy an escarpment of rocks that are called the Vermilion Cliffs. And they would prompt him to write, quote, They are a very pale pink and make me wish for the real Vermilion Cliffs of Utah and Arizona, end quote. I know the feeling. I often miss the Southwest when an imitation flirts its way into my vision. Everett makes it to Yosemite on September 29th, and somehow, Grandmother Burrow still had not given birth. And also, because of the lateness of the season, it was surprisingly empty. Quote, The deer hunters are discouraged or sated. The schoolboys have gone back to their studies. And vacation time is over for the populace. But this is not vacation time for me. This is my life. End quote. But he'd only spend two weeks at his destination, and most of it was indoors at the headquarters, store, museum, and library. His checks were still coming, and with it he bought caviar and foie gras. And that is a Quite the life, indeed. He then saw himself in a mirror, a thing I guess we take for granted, and he wrote, quote, My self-confidence dropped to zero at once. I looked like a ghoul or an ogre, end quote. So he headed to the barber for a trim and a shave, uh, because he did not ever shave or trim himself. An important fact to keep in mind for later. From Yosemite, his plan was to head to San Francisco, where he'd finally live out his Bohemian Rhapsody. He wrote of his goal, quote, I planned how I would rent a little garret on some city hilltop and have a place all my own. From it, I would sally forth to make color studies of tropical fish in the park, to concerts, to library expeditions, and devil-may-care wanderings in the city and on the seafront, end quote. So, basically, every 19-year-old artist's dream. I was actually voted my senior year of high school at Edmond North in Oklahoma as most likely to sell my art on the streets of Paris. I did not pursue uh, that bestowed upon me dream. I gave up for pretty much the same reason Everett would have to eventually. How would he pay for it? For rent, for food, for concerts, etc.? Maybe those checks still coming from his parents? Actually, we will get to see that in the very near future. That is exactly how he planned on paying for it. In his last few days in Yosemite, Everett heads to the park library and he picks up a book. A novel, really, that is called The Fountain by Charles Morgan. Back in its day, it was a major hit. It was a bestseller and it involved the massive saga of a British soldier who was captured and sent to a prisoner camp. Uh, that camp was in Holland during World War I. Then the British soldier embroils himself in a passionate and fiery love affair with a German officer's wife. Well, Everett read this sucker in a day and a half, and it made an enormous impact on him. He wrote in his journal, quote, My heart leaped when I learned the subject, the contemplative life, the inner stillness which I too am striving to attain, though I am not done with the wild songs of youth, end quote. In the middle of reading the novel, he paused for a moment to write down his thoughts further in his journal. I suppose a great and soul-filling love is perhaps the greatest experience a man may have, but it is such a rarity as to be almost negligible. End quote. If only he had lived to feel such a great and soul-filling love. So this Sierra part of this adventure was over. But what had he accomplished? I mean, not very many pieces of art, or not very many grand writings. He rarely strayed far from a trail, or a person, or a museum, or even a ranger station, or a book. Definitely never strayed from a fishing rod. And towards the end, he didn't seem all that inspired. At one point in his final days in the Sierras, he recorded that he hadn't slept in 70 hours. 70 hours seems impossible, but I mean, I have to wonder what on earth he was doing. Fishing more? 
It seems he did more of that than anything else. I'm a little jealous of all of his free time and wandering and thinking. In this small town of El Portal, El Portal maybe, which is indeed a portal to Yosemite, just west of the mountains. In El Portal, he sold his burros, hopped a freight train to Sacramento, like a hobo, learned from the vagabond veterans, and made his way to the Pacific. He wrote of the train hopping, quote, When we pulled out, one of the fellows found a reefer, a refrigerator car, and while the cars were gathering speed, we ran the length of the train on top, leaping from one car to another till we reached it, end quote. Once inside the refrigerator car, Everett found a pile of fresh cantaloupes, which he rested on while chatting and laughing with the other bums. As my wife commented when I told her this story, she said, People just used to be able to do things, huh? And she's right. Life was way more fun before the many rules and regulations and man and... Uh, yeah, you know. But the line about running on the top of the train, I couldn't help but think of Last Crusade. Once in Oakland, his birthplace, he would find a place and live rather humbly, although more lavish than the woods. He'd sell a few prints every now and then, but not too much. He went to many, many concerts, and he ate cold food since he had no kitchen, and he'd, he'd mostly get by. He stayed broke, and continually accepted money from his parents and his brother now. But he would meet many amazing artists. I imagine just by going up to their doors and knocking on them, as usual. In reality, San Francisco and those artists would be a life-changing event for him that made him really respect art even more, somehow. And they made him want to strive to be a better artist. At one point while in the city, he met the Western painter Maynard Dixon, who would teach him a few things, and they'd really become friends. Uh, if you look up Maynard Dixon's paintings and then look at Everett's block prints, you can tell the influence. But Maynard Dixon's paintings are beautiful and evoke really well the scenes of the American Southwest. I hadn't recognized the name Maynard Dixon when I was reading that Everett had met him, but as soon as I saw his artwork, I knew I recognized him. He painted cowboys, Indians, buttes, and mesas, saguaros, mountains, valleys, and quite a few Mark Maggiore-style clouds and, some, and even storms that hovered over the barren desert. Mark Maggiore recently posted a picture of one of his old paintings, and I commented, that looks like a little bit of Maynard Dixon influence. They are beautiful and colorful paintings, and they do evoke the feeling of the American Southwest. Everett also met Ansel Adams, the photographer, and traded works with him. This is the same Ansel Adams who was so good at taking pictures of the wild and wooly western landscapes, like Yosemite, that he is still recognized and very popular today. I mean, trust me, you've seen his amazing black and white photographs. They are breathtaking. Ansel Adams even kept a frame artwork of Everett's on his own wall at his house right up until at least 2009. Beyond Ansel, though, Everett also met Dorothy Lang, and she photographed him. The picture of Everett that she took during a session is one of the most famous of the traveling adventure va vagabond that exists. And if you're not familiar with the name Dorothy Lang, you are familiar with her work, or at least one picture in particular. That picture is Migrant Mother, the very famous photograph of the woman with the two kids leaning on her during the Great Depression. It is possibly the most famous picture to come out of that tough time in uh, American history. After meeting artists who swapped works with him, taught him lessons, and made him their muse, despite those amazing experiences, Everett grew tired of the city of San Francisco rather quickly. And truthfully, obviously, he wanted to be back in his first true love. The warm embrace of the desert of the American Southwest. I imagine being around Maynard Dixon and his paintings didn't help. <laughs> 
although in December he wrote to Waldo of a different warm embrace, quote, I have met some fine, sincere men and several fine women, and one girl with whom I am intimate, end quote. Wait a minute, record scratch. In Vagabond for Beauty, Russo would write, quote, This girl was undoubtedly Frances. Who she was, or however it met her, remains unknown. But for a brief period, at least, romance had entered Everett's life. End quote. Russo somehow found and copied five letters from Everett to this mysterious Frances. And one of them, from December 14th, 1933, stated, quote, I have just acquired the most heart-rending symphony you ever heard. You must come out to my mean hovel Saturday night to hear it, for I have to share it with you. In addition, there are two things I want to read to you, and a new picture I want you to see. Don't refuse, for I must see you, and I have laid in a store of Roquefort cheese as a special inducement. I saw two girls on the streets this morning who reminded me of you. End quote. Another of his letters is only one line long and is dated Monday afternoon. It states, Francis, dear, Teresine dances tomorrow night at 8.20, so sleep sweetly tonight. Everett. Yet another letter from December 19th during this whirlwind affair stated, quote, To Francis, I wish the most blithe and serene Christmas that anyone could wish. Everett. Unfortunately, this young love wasn't meant to last, much like Everett's seemingly endless adventures. For on May 5th, jumping ahead a little, obviously, because that was December, and now it is May of the following year that I'm going to read this from, but in May, while he is out in Arizona, he writes a long letter to this mysterious and lost Francis where he says, quote, I was sorry, though, that our intimacy, like many things that are and will be, had to die with a dying fall. I do not greatly mind endings, for my life is made up of them. But sometimes they come too soon or too late, and sometimes they leave a feeling of regret as of an old mistake or an indirect futility. End quote. Why did he have to say with a dying fall? To this day, Francis's identity is a complete mystery. Even her last name is unknown. And then, the letters to her went missing. Robert says this of the strange events surrounding this strange girl. When asked in 2008 about the Francis letters, Russo had no answers. He was not aware that the letters had gone missing, or where they might be. He could not recall how he had gotten hold of them in the first place, although he thought it likely that Waldo had lent them to him. When asked how the family could have gained possession of the letters without knowing who Francis was, he confessed to his own complete bafflement. End quote. I don't like mentioning this, as I already said, but the theory is persistent and lewd. Uh, it persists with those who have an agenda and think Everett is gay, and they push that these letters were some sort of cover-up I mean, but obviously that's just silly projection by people who are not well and who wish to distort all people of the past to fit their own ideology. This specific theory, if you're wondering why I keep using words like agenda, this specific theory about Everett being gay was put forward by a filmmaker who thought of the concept in the 80s. The full letters sound real enough, though, and the line to Waldo is proof enough for me. He wasn't one to hide any of his feelings, Everett. Why would he hide this, or lie, or obfuscate? Plus, future writings and letters vindicate his reality. By now, Everett's parents, it seems, were losing a little bit of patience with his vagabond wandering lifestyle. In letters to Christopher and Stella, he would defend himself and write, quote, During this last year, I have continued to seek beauty and friendship and I think that I have really brought some beauty and delight into the lives of others, and that is at least something, end quote. I mean, I suppose it is, yes. And it is true he will be bringing beauty and delight into people's lives as long as his books are published and podcasters quote from him. But we all can't just be wanderers all the time. <laughs> 
Everett's parents also tried to get him to go back to college, but to no avail. He wrote to them in response, quote, You could be ashamed of me if you like, but you cannot make me feel ashamed of myself. As for me, I have tasted your cake and I prefer your unbuttered bread. I don't wish to withdraw from life to college, and I have a notion, conceited or not, that I know what I want from life and can act upon it. End quote. Before Everett left San Francisco, he would head northwards along the coast and hike among the redwoods. He would spearfish salmon and photograph rocks, stay in abandoned lumber mill towns. At one point, he'd stay for a week at a large sheep ranch owned by a man from Afghanistan who had a German wife and who was fostering an Italian child and an American and a Negro boy. After that last jaunt, he'd write of re-entering San Francisco... Quote, the city seemed senselessly hideous and squatted when I re-entered it today, after the clean spaciousness of green hills and blue seas. End quote. He would, though, take the photographer, uh, Dorothy Lang, and her husband Maynard Dixon, the painter, he would take them back up to see and photograph this con from Afghanistan. And he would do that only mere days before purchasing a ticket on a boat, riding it to Los Angeles, or he would stay with his family for a month. San Francisco was over, but not his adventuring. And that is where I will end this second episode of The Adventuring of Everett Ruiz, our vagabond for beauty. In the next episode, we will go on his final adventure, and it is to the American Southwest. This final amazing journey is his most profound and exciting yet, and not just because he disappears completely from the face of the entire planet afterwards, but he goes on an archaeological dig for weeks. He sees Lukachuka and Chuska Mountains, places nobody goes even today, really. Spends a week in Flagstaff, meets more amazing people, goes to the Grand Canyon, goes to Bryce Canyon, Escalant, and then... He vanishes. So stay tuned while we wrap up his story. The fourth episode will be trying to find Everett Rubis and the mystery surrounding his disappearance or perhaps murder. I'll see y'all again soon in the American Southwest.